Hello, and everybody, welcome to the Intelligent Change Podcast. I'm so excited to have Chloe McIntosh as our first guest. Good morning. Yeah, you're one of the most transformational guests that we're, we're having on because I love your story. So we met in Paris, and I truly enjoyed your story of there's so many journeys that you went through your life. And now we found out you're also a model, <laughs> then you're an architect, then you're a high-flying entrepreneur who's built an incredible unicorn, and that's quite a journey as well. And, and now you're transforming the whole sexual wellness space. And uh, what I love about yourself is your ambitiousness to create change mm. uh, and make a difference in people's lives. And I think that's the journey that you're on. That's why you're here. So thank you so much, Chloe, for being part of Intelligent Change. Thank you both. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah. So I think the w way I love to start is really in that er earlier journey through the, the transformation of really you becoming, like I said, from model to architect to entrepreneur, because there's so many people who are uh, always thinking like, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. Mm. So take us to that journey. How do you go from corporate to an entrepreneur? Uh, and of course, sexual and entrepreneur after, but I'm, I'm curious about that, you know, VC backed, high flying unicorn creation uh, time of yours, which was really intense. Right, yeah. So I, I started, um, actually, I went into architecture when I was a student uh, because I was a creative person at heart, but I grew up in a relatively precarious environment where financial stability wasn't a part of my everyday life. And so, you know, what's interesting with the creative industries is that they, they're not really recognized mm -hmm. so much by the professional, you know, kind of environment. And often as a creative, because you live off your creativity, you shouldn't really be paid that well. And also there is a lot of insecurity in the jobs because what, you know, if you study sculpture or history of art, well, what job are you going to go mm -hmm. into? So in Paris, even though you'd think it's one of the most creative cities around, as a person growing up, instead of going for my pure creative expression and go towards the things that I really was passionate about, I had to compromise at a young age and think of, okay, what's the profession within the creative field that will give me uh, an actual job? And that's what architecture. So I chose it a little bit by default, in a sense. It gave me this idea that after seven years, which is a very long training, you get a diploma. It's recognized by the states. In France, it's, it's a big diploma. So I had this kind of security that came with this piece of paper that I knew would give me a job and give me potentially a career path that was both creative, but also could give me, you know, whatever I needed financially to feel stable. And I studied at Les Beaux-Arts in Paris, which was a, a very poetic experience because Les Beaux-Arts is where a lot of masters of French uh, painting went to sculpture, etc. It's a very romantic school. You don't really learn how to be an architect. You draw nude for six hours a day. You uh, imagine buildings that you can't actually really build. There's a lot of imagination and creativity. So actually that was a really good compromise upon what I wanted to experience. And then after four years, I realized I need to find a job, you know, I need to find a way to work. So I went to London and completely by accident, I went through a, a form of recruitment uh, experience at Norman Foster, who was recruiting heavily for the uh, interns, the summer interns, because they have a lot of competitions. So I came in through the small door halfway through my studies and then I ended up doing something a little bit unconventional because I ended up completing my studies while working full-time which was never something they'd done in the school mm -hmm. but I think the school had recognized that finding a job in such a prestigious agency coming from Paris was an amazing opportunity for me and it would have been really silly not to find a way for me to continue that that work that they were offering me to do so I ended up staying there for nine years I, I was the youngest associate partner because I started while studying and from there, you know, I realized architecture may not be the path for me uh, because it wasn't that creative. And when I got pregnant with my second son, I decided to move into technology. Uh, at the time, this is 2007. Mm -hmm. Technology was not even the way we described the industry. We call it the internet, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because it was a service. It was a platform. There was a very clear definition around what it was, where now it's obviously infiltrated into everything. So it's very hard to define. But at the time, you were building websites, and that's what we were doing. So I joined Be Brent Huberman, the founder of LastNute.com, and he wanted to build a big platform for interior design. And so he took me out of architecture, 
gave me a day to make up my mind to join something that truly I didn't understand. I had no idea what he was talking about. You know, I, it was at a time where the internet was used to buy flight tickets, uh, you know, things like that. It was nothing like what it is today. And so I got into this new world of digital very far away from my roots. You know, I come from a very uh, artistic family. My mother is a poetry artist. Uh, I had never really been into anything quite as consumer focused because now we were really talking about being in front of the customer. And if you think about architecture, it takes about 10 years to actually have the customer experience where you create mm -hmm. minimum. It's a very long process to get the feedback. So suddenly I was in an industry where you build something, you put it out and people tell you what they like, what they don't like, and then you can iterate. It completely blew my mind. I fell in love with the process. I thought what an amazing industry that you can only build what people really want. So that's when I realized that's where I truly belong. I want that. I want to be in that experience. So I stayed there for a few years and then I lost a little bit of interest with the business. It was very heavily tech driven. And then Brent, myself and two other co-founders decided to create Made.com, which is kind of a spin-off. So in 2010, we launched this direct-to-consumer homeware brand um, that was very designer focused. The idea was to help designers, the big community of designers who didn't have route to market for their designs, to come to the platform, put their products for crowdsourcing, our community would vote for the one they really wanted, and then we would put them into production with a manufacturer, um, and we would be able to sell those products before they were even fabricated. So we had this very interesting kind of reverse supply chain that gave us a huge advantage in an industry, in the furniture industry, that was at the time super backwards. You know, nothing had happened that had changed the industry at the time. People just put their furniture catalog online, but there was nothing more that you gain from being an online platform. So we really allowed for that to change and use the internet as the way to change the supply chain, as a way to change the process. And mostly, I would say, give consumer better value. You know, all the savings we made by cutting the middleman where the discount we were able to offer to the consumer. And I think beyond the discount was the transparency. It was a time where customers were asking more. They wanted to know who you were, where things were coming from, how much money was being paid to what exactly. So we had to be more transparent and explain to them how we were doing things. And the business grew very quickly. We exited last year um, at close to a billion. So it was a very interesting journey for me. I stepped down, however, earlier um, to, to join, you know, other to, to take a break also. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about that decision of leaving a company that's growing and so successful? What happened to you on that journey of, of course, being a mom of two at the time mm -hmm. already and working so hard to also, um, you know, make sure that the business was doing well and you're growing as a person as well and then also being a wife to your husband. So how, how did that go for you, managing it all as a woman? Um, you know how it is. You, in the moment, you just do what you need to do. The, the, if we thought about it this way, it would be impossible to do anything, right? So in the moment, you just need to make the next decision. And for me, in the moment, the next decision was, I'm burned out. How you did know? you know you were burnt out? Because a lot of it people don't identify time. for a very long time that they're at the very bottom yeah. and something needs to change. The burnouts, you're aware that you are burning as soon as you are burning. Mm -hmm. But you, are, you think it's okay, it's a phase, and I'm building a business. Mm -hmm. it, that's what it takes. You, know, you need to get to your edges and, and mm -hmm. stay and, and serve that, making sure you're not burning completely, but mm -hmm. you know that the burning is part of the process. You can't do it. Mm -hmm without feeling exposed, you know, to that kind of pressure. So there was a mix of things. There was a not very fluid dynamic of relationship between founders, which was not a block to the business, but it made the burn stronger for me, you know, having to fight a lot. Mm -hmm. And at that stage of the business, I also didn't want to be in such a large business. You know, we grew from, you know how it is, you get from a team of let's say 25, 30, 50, and then you get to 200. And then it's no longer the same thing you're doing. I was mostly as a creative, as the main creative founder in my founding team, I was looking after uh, product development, brand and marketing, so all the creative side. And I was managing agencies. 
because we were in seven countries. I was managing the local creative agency so that they could create. And I just realized my job had no more creativity in it. And mm. that's often what happens as a creative executive. Mm -hmm. The more you grow up the ladder, the more you obtain, you know, I guess more access and you manage more people, the less you are creative. And this has been a big battle in my career. You know, how do I remain my mm -hmm. true creative self, which is also when I enjoy myself the most and I think when I'm the best at what I do, and yet I'm a CEO now, you know, and that's, it, that, that's definitely something to, to look at. So I was burnt out and I knew because uh, towards the end of it, I actually wanted to leave the business and it was a very complicated process for me to leave. I was also the face of MADE for a long time. So it took a long time for me to be able to extract myself. Mm -hmm. And I remember coming home um, in the evening, arriving at home, looking at my house, switching off the light and leaving again. That's when I knew I had reached the bottom because I'm someone who loves being on their own. I've always loved my own company. And the fact that I couldn't go home to front myself was mm. a clear sign that something was wrong. It was very clear to me. So I knew it. I couldn't do anything about it yet. I had to go through the process. So I went through the process and after I stepped down, I then went to, I, then I was looking for some for something to repair. Then I was looking for where do I go? You know, what place can I go to? What uh, retreat center? What organization program can I go to to mm. support myself with? I needed support. I needed some kind mm. of reboot. And I ended up, after a lot of research, tumbling across this place in Alicante called Shah. Mm -hmm. I've heard of it. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes. Very interesting place. It's a futuristic building in the middle of Alicante. There's nothing glamorous about it, but it's very futuristic. And mm -hmm. you go in and everyone wears this white blouse mm -hmm. and it's all holistic health. Yeah. So, you know, it's all, they, they put technology over uh, a lot of holistic uh, me methodology and technology. So they're able to measure a certain amount of things within your, your body and your organism, how you balance. And then they give you a program and it's all microbiotic. And I learned about, through microbiotic, I learned about really how our system works mm. completely and how everything works, actually. The microbiotic diet is an amazing science of understanding because it's all about balance. It tells you that what we do all day, all we do all day is try to go back to balance. Mm. So what we do in our life every day, how far it's taking us away from our center is going to be the work we're going to spend doing that rather than growing, expanding, mm -hmm. you know, doing other things that can make us, you know, have a, a richer experience. Instead, we're just repairing. We're just trying to find balance again. So we do it with food, with exercise, with activities, with emotions, with relationships. And that was a true realization that we are lazy as a body. The mind is lazy, the body is lazy. It's gonna, always going to look for the simplest, easiest way mm -hmm. to operate. And that is to sit and try to find balance, you know, and until we're there, we can't actually be uh, as effective and efficient as we could be. So that was a big shift for me mm -hmm. in the life I was living, full of stress, pulling, not sleeping, mm -hmm. working hard, not mm -hmm. eating, you know, trying to manage all, you, all the things you're saying with mm -hmm. the kids, the, and actually there was no balance. Mm -hmm. And how was that adjustment? Because I see a lot of entrepreneurs, um, our friends of ours as well, who've also sold businesses for hundreds of millions. Uh, and it seems like they're on overdrive and they can't stop. Meaning their body, in a way, there's this great book called Body Keeps the Score. And they're kind of like this moving train that keeps going and going all out and burning out. And that's kind of their normal. Mm. <laughs> so and then all of a sudden you have that exit or you leave this big company. And then there's silence or there's quiet as you said you mm -hmm. go into your house mm -hmm. and it's it's you by yourself and in a way that what i've been hearing they're actually scared and it actually brings more anxiety into their life and what happens many times they're like well i'll go to back to the state where at least i'm most comfortable mm -hmm. so they start building another thing but they're just doing it just for the sake of it they don't have to do it anymore mm -hmm. so how did you yourself overcome that potential 
you know, drive and desire to just keep burning to, yeah. to keep, and doing. You know, I don't know if it's the keep burning. It's the success that is the addiction. It's mm. the it's the recognition. Mm. And we live in a city that is very active, very intense. There's a lot of ac- you know business happens. There's a lot of social activity. Mm. So status and recognition becomes a big part of how we see ourselves, mm. especially. As a young woman growing in Paris, I I grew up with very little. I didn't have a path in front of me. I really had to carve it myself. So there is an element of, well, first, how far can I go? Because you don't know. Mm. You know, you see yourself succeeding and you're like, oh. And then you realize it's not about success, you know, but that's the long term (laughs) realization. So what I did first is I committed to myself and actually really the realization I needed to repair. And then after that, I knew I wanted to create Kama, my current business. And I took many years. So this was in 2015. I, start, I created Kama in 2019. I purposely took this time to one, not work for the first time in my life. So I, I joined uh, Felix Capital, a really wonderful VC firm as a venture partner. And I gave advice, etc. But it was very light touch for what I usually was used mm. to. I had worked since I was 14, you know. So it was the first time in my life that I wasn't working like an animal. I also, my marriage collapsed during the burnout. Um, and so we separated with my husband in a very beautiful way. Um, and we were able to create a very beautiful transition for the children and have, I think, what for me was a very successful divorce experience, which wasn't the case. I grew up with very dysfunctional parenting where my parents separated when I was one and never talked to each other. They talked to each other twice at my uh, diploma and my wedding. So it's a very, for me, I had a very clear idea that I wanted this process to be really successful. I wanted it to be a beautiful experience for everyone, in a sense. And then after that, I realized uh, I was financially stable. I had my children 50% of the time and I didn't have a job. I thought, Chloe, maybe this is the time where you have fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> this Finally, time, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I met my current, uh, my, my best friend, who basically I met at a party. And uh, we went to Burning Man together. I went to do uh, my first plant medicine experience. I started to really go outside of not the comfort zone, because I was never someone that would be comfort zone based, but definitely, you know, my construct. I, I, I realized at that point how many things were conditioning me to think, mm-hmm. to behave a particular way in relationships, towards my children, my family. You know, who I was as a person had been a series of inherited behavior from other people for the longest time. Mm-hmm. I never really had the chance to look at myself, never had the space or time to do that. And I didn't have the space in my head because I needed to work to make money and stabilize myself. I needed to raise the children. You know, there was too many things. Mm -hmm. Suddenly I had this opportunity. So I really embraced it and I decided to uh, explore and travel. And I had what I call my yes year. I said yes to everything. I love it. And it changed my life. I mean, it, it was amazing. So I did that for about a year and a half, and then um, Soho, Soho House contacted me. Uh, Nick Jones um, called me up and asked me if I could help them with launching their homeware brand. So I joined them uh, to do a consulting job, which then took me to become their chief creative officer for a few years. And that was my second like, intentional move, was to go back into corporation. When you're a founder, you lose touch with what it's like to be an employee. Mm-hmm. You do. and. That creates difficult culture within the tech world because often founders think, I will never be able to work for someone else. I don't think that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's an experience that we need to be reminded of. So me personally, I wanted to go back and work for someone. And so I joined Soul House uh, and I was able to really immerse myself back into a structure, understand politics and processes and what's working, what's not working. And to go back to your question about like success and how do we agree that success is enough, I actually asked myself that question. My main practice was, why do you want to create Kama? And I asked myself the question until the answer was, because it's my mission mm. and not because, it, which was there. I promise you it was there always because I want to be seen to do this on my own, because I want to prove I can do it, because I can be a solo founder, because maybe I can do this 
all these things were in my head. It took so you were time. waiting for the right answer. I was waiting for me to be true to myself, mm -hmm. that I would not start something for the wrong reasons. And actually, you know, what's interesting is that I then left Soho House in 2019 to go raise money. I raised about three and a half million dollars uh, for Kama. And a few months after, I realized that I also did that to prove it. It was the last piece. You know, I could see there was still an attachment to demonstrate I can get all these amazing investors. I had an amazing cap table. I have the most beautiful cap table, mm -hmm. you know? And so I really crafted that because for me, it was so important to surround myself with the right people. So it's very hard to be truly clear about why you're doing something. And I think that it's a process of asking yourself the question, why are you doing this? And if it's for success status, it's okay. But it's important to know it. And me, I didn't want it to be for those reasons. Because on a mission, which I'd never been part of a mission business before, I didn't even know what it means. Mm. I had no idea. What does it mean? It means that the energy that drives you isn't just inside of you. Oh. There isn't a mission there are the people on that mission and they are driving it and if you want to do this well you have to be both attuned with yourself and attuned with what's happening around you so suddenly I, I couldn't just rely on my intuitions my entire life my intuitions were like a, a, a compass that gives me black and white answers beautiful compass and then suddenly I couldn't do it anymore I had to feel where is this going you know what other people are doing how can I contribute to the mission. I'm contributing to the mission. The mission isn't mine. I don't own the mission. The mission to make sexuality, you know, available and a big part of our life so that we can fully appreciate what it is for is, is a completely different endeavor than let's make this business successful. And that is a challenge for me today in my relationship with investors and etc. Yeah, I think uh, this is where we also really connected in conversation in regards to our second business now in this podcast mm -hmm. obviously intelligent change we also feel we're on the mission it's not about business this is the reason why we also you know i get uh, mimi knows i get emailed probably every week hey i'd love to invest and 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 you have to say no mm -hmm. um what i'm really curious before we dive into comment what you're doing which is the strong mission of yours i'm really curious about a lot of what you're saying really is driven by the fact of that you're able to have that intuition with yourself and, and that connection with yourself to be able to even see what is your mission, what is that calling, what is, and, and I think a lot of people, especially high performers in the business world that I see, they're simply out of touch with their body, uh, with the, even um, their mind in some certain ways. Um, and I think w it took, as you said yourself, that space and that time for you to be able to connect and then be on a uh, new chapter and, and, and intelligent change in your life in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about what tips could you give to other people like yourself who've maybe built huge businesses or unicorns or whatever, and at the same time... Or maybe who are just starting yeah, out or, as or well. Or maybe they're just and starting learning out. learning about yeah. mm -hmm. that connection to the intuition. <sighs> Some things don't have shortcuts. And we know wisdom is one of those. We're trying to shortcut wisdom these days very heavily, and we will find ways because we always do. And I'm not saying this is wisdom, but in the way of connecting with oneself, it's a practice. You know, one of the things that, I've, that has transformed my life and that I've learned through uh, learning more about sexuality and sexual well-being and embodiment is that this system that is our body is the most advanced technology that we will ever interact with. Forget about going to Mars. This is the deal. You've got it here. And not only this, it provides you with any human experience you could ever dream of. All of it. Because you leave it in your body. So it, you can have the experience elsewhere. But that is not the experience. So first is the realization that we are meant to live in the body. And that very often what we, it's a big blind spot for people because we have such a cerebral, mm -hmm. you know, experience of the world because our society is designed so much around um, intellectual status becoming the way of evaluating ourselves mm -hmm. and how well we do and how important we are. Okay. It's very much, and in France it's, it's very true, but I think it's true everywhere. Mm -hmm. 
And if you look even at the consciousness uh, uh, movement and, you know, with modern philosophers and, and people really researching, you know, neuroscience, they are all in their heads. None of them or very few maybe have a strong embodiment practice. And this is the discovery that I have made, that if you want to get out of your head, mm -hmm. you've got to be in the body. It's a switch. Mm -hmm. So tell us more. Yeah, this term embodiment, <laughs> I love it. We were talking about it earlier today. Even to me, and you said to yourself as well, it's still quite a new term, and I hear it more and more these days. But what exactly does embodiment mean for anybody who is listening and maybe hearing this term for the first time? So embodiment uh, is learning uh, through the body. So you're, you're embodied when you have learned something in the body where your body can do it without you having to think about it. That is embodiment. So for example, if you want to have a more embodied way to breathe, mm -hmm. You would be first be very conscious about how you breathe and as we know we breathe in the wrong way around right so we should be breathing into mm -hmm. the belly mm -hmm. when you look at a baby when they're born you see their belly go up and down that's the right way to breathe you have to remember as well that the inhale is the sympathetic breath is the f fight and fright mm -hmm. <gasps> right and then the exhale is the parasympathetic <sighs> most people breathe in and don't breathe out. <laughs> <laughs> and then the breath. It's very shallow, right? It's very it stays shallow, here. right? Everything is very shallow. So you never really get a full breath. And without getting a full breath, you're not able to regulate your nervous system. So when people get super stressed and into, you know, anxiety, it, I'm not saying this is the solution. Everyone has their own mm -hmm. particular situation and this is not a fit for all. But what I've learned is that practice you know, is how we interact with our system. Mm -hmm. We are fully programmable, entirely programmable. We have people like Joe Dispenza who's in a wheelchair and, you know, reprogram himself to fully function. There's millions of stories of people who have used practice as a way to overcome uh, medical conditions that from the medical field we're not going to be able to, you know, mm. solution themselves. So I think there is a lot of uh, a lack of knowledge and a lack of trust and belief and understanding we can program ourselves completely. We can decide to create, we create new neural pathway all the time. We're doing it now. The question is how intentional do you want to be about the pathway that you built? Mm -hmm. And the more intentional you are with the pathways, the more intentional you are with the way you breathe, move, hold mm -hmm. yourself. You know, embodiment is understanding that your being is your entire body. You communicate with your entire body. You connect with your entire body, you think with your entire body, you feel with your entire body. That's embodiment, is the idea that energy can be distributed everywhere through mindfulness. And when your energy is distributed everywhere, then you have access to information that doesn't just come from your brain center. Because mm -hmm. we know there is intelligence in the heart center. We know there is intelligence in our gut, I mean, mm -hmm. the first brain. We know there is intelligence in the genitals. You know, intelligence travels. So if you want to tap into another area of your body, you bring your attention there. Mm. You start feeling from your heart. You start speaking from your heart. You start choosing a tone that is not such a high tone when I'm telling you about this story and what happened. I'm telling you about this story and what happened. You know, you, you choose a way to speak that is embodied. You choose a way to move that shows people that you are safe in your body. Mm. You're not going to do something unexpected. You're not going to suddenly have a weird behavior because you are here, mm. not just in your head. You're mm. here, present, everywhere. You know where your toes at. You know where your knees at. You know where your back's at. You know the weight on the chair. You can feel the air. You can smell the air. And when you can, touch something. Me, I'm always touching something <laughs> because I'm resensitizing myself mm -hmm. by being aware of senses. Mm -hmm. Mm, I love it. Uh, Chloe, thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm, I'm already, I think, mm -hmm. through this conversation, I'm feeling more embodied in terms of you're bringing awareness to ourselves. I Absolutely. think sitting here, you're like, yeah. oh, all of a sudden, I think I'm maybe, breathing deeper. maybe people watching or listening as well. You're like, you know, you, it, it in a way brings out more senses. And I, and I thank you for that. And that's why when I first saw you speak in Paris, I was like, I'm always, as all of us were kind of seeing and looking for something 
but I really related with your authenticity in regards to your story. And that's why even I'm excited to have this conversation with you. And one of the words that you keep bringing up is intelligence. And this is, I know, something that you, we want to chat about. Uh, but I'm curious about what's your, in a way, definition of intelligence and how do you connect with your work now? So I believe intelligence in, is in every of our cells. Actually, all our cells are pretty mm -hmm. much the same. I'm sure you saw the octopus teacher, and I'm I very love that fascinated by the octopus. And the octopus, it's not in that, in that film, but you know, the octopus is the most fragile animal in the ocean. And uh, it's the most vulnerable animal in the ocean, right? It's, 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 it's shell-less, it's delicious, you can, everyone can eat it. And so it had to become intelligent, more intelligent than any other animal in the ocean. And the way it became intelligent is by spreading its brain cells into its tentacles. So that's how they can regrow an arm, for example. So when we bring attention to other places in our body, we bring intelligence with it. Oh. So if you want to build more heart intelligence, you practice heart coherence. It gives you more heart intelligence. It means that you have more focus and attention there. Mm. Everything is attention. Everything we, we experience is because we have our attention on it. It exists by attention. So you can decide where you want the attention to go. This is where the energy will flow. And with this will come intelligence. And intelligence means that you will be able to use that as a way to make decisions and feel yourself through the world. So for example, if I spend a lot of time making my heart more conscious by practicing talking from my heart as mm -hmm. I was saying to you before I speak to someone I imagine that my intelligence center is in my heart and there was a, a very in fun, fun story of this group uh, of monks which were visited by a neuroscientist who came to Tibet because he really wanted to measure the brain waves of those monks and so he goes there and he wants to reassure the monks about the equipment so he puts the cap on his head and they start laughing and he gets a bit upset because it's pretty expensive equipment and he's come all the way to Tibet and he says, what's going on? And the monks say, but what are you looking for up here? Meditation happens here. So I believe that we have corrupted what meditation actually is by making it a cerebral experience because we can't help ourselves. So meditation for most people means sit cross-legged without moving and try not to think. Mm -hmm. You can do that, but mm -hmm. it's more important to do the things we talked about around yeah. feeling yeah. and touching and breathing and connecting with the environment and spending moment on your, on your own and doing these things. You don't need to sit still to meditate. You know, the point of meditation is not to meditate. The point of meditation is to be able to be in a meditative state as often as you can without meditating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so uh, when I went to Shah, I learned mm -hmm. effortless mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And effortless mindfulness is how to meditate all the time, mm -hmm. everywhere. And that shifted mm -hmm. where my intuitions, my intelligence came from. When I started to tap into those other centers and put my attention on it, I started realizing for me, what was the biggest breakthrough in, in, in my kind of discovery of what embodiment is, is that I experienced expansion of my mind and I thought, what an extraordinary experience that you can push the boundaries of your own mind, but you can do the same in your body. You can expand your body. And I had never even, even considered that you can do that. And by expand, I mean the more you spend time, the more information comes. So for sexuality, it's a very important component. Yeah, this is why I think we now come to this mm -hmm. chapter of your life. As you said, you know, the society a lot of time corrupts, uh, whether it is mindfulness or meditation or, or sexuality. And please tell us more regarding, as you said, you know, I think 25% of the traffic or more is towards porn, mm -hmm. uh, but I'd love to hear about how society in a way has corrupted the sexual experience and mm -hmm. what you're doing to change that. 
Yes, yeah, so I uh, came to take an interest into sexuality a little bit by accident. 17 years ago, I was pregnant with Felix and I just had a big physical transformation. I became really turned on. I wasn't a very sexual person, you know, I'm not one of those people who go into creating a sex business because they fully sexualize and that's been part of their life. It's actually something I discovered uh, along the way. And around that time, as you mentioned, I was like, okay, well, where do I look for information? And I realized very quickly that apart from porn and medical websites that often actually tell you what not to do, there was just nothing in between. And this was like almost 20 years ago. I thought as a business person, I thought, that is insane, that doesn't exist anymore. A, a, an area that hasn't really been disrupted by the internet um, because it was disrupted with porn, but there was still a lot of us yeah. who may want an alternative to porn or something as well as that's a little bit more educational, informative, that can give you maybe a, a path to, to, to learn if you think about it. Sexuality is probably the only thing in our life that hasn't evolved. We have sex the same way we did when we were cave people. You know, we haven't, re if you look at porn today and the way it's portrayed and uh, at, 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 at scale, you, you know, you can't see that sexuality and our understanding of sexuality and expansion of sexuality has evolved. Mm. So it's interesting that this hasn't really evolved when it's such a really big part of, should be a big part of our life. Mm. And I think it's been so well tamed and repressed that we actually grow up not asking the questions. Mm -hmm. So for me, the biggest kind of realization was I'm 38, uh, not sorry, I was 29, pregnant with my first son. And it's the first time I asked myself about sexuality. It's the first time I'd actually really go deeper to look for answers. And at the time I, I realized that starting a business in, in the sex space was not possible uh, because we were not where we are now uh, in terms of like mindfulness hadn't really come to market. Sex was associated to porn. Actually, sex was considered a vice industry within the kind of the VC world because it was labeled sex, not porn. So it meant that no one could raise money. So I waited a, a while and then realized uh, a few years ago that sexual wellness started to become something that people talked about. And I think that that gave me the incentive that actually there was an opening for me to go raise money. So that's when I went to raise money for, for this business. But my journey has been to go through the process of discovering very much in the same way that anyone who's coming to realize that maybe they want to go into that area. It's exactly the same process. You know, I started training, I would say practicing, which is what I'm encouraging people to do, is to first learn about their body, understand, I would say, the main principle of sexuality, how it works, uh, what is it for, how do we breathe, you know, how do we move the body, uh, what does the anatomy tell us, what's the story of the anatomy, what can we learn about the anatomy that is not very well researched and eventually then go into practice. And by practice, it just means, you know, I'm going to start learning to breathe differently mm -hmm. and I'm going to apply different types of breathing which activate different effects in the body. You know, any athlete or performer knows that when they master the breath, they master their optimal performance, right? It's the most important component of any performance is breathing. So it's the same with sex, except again, we don't think about it. So we breathe in a very shallow way, <laughs> very high, hyperventilating, uh, sympathetic breath. So we're in the fright and fight mode when we're supposed to be in the rest and restore and have sex mode, <laughs> which you know we, we don't get to experience very much. So there was a lot of fundamental myths and misunderstanding that I went through one after the other. And it was like, I was like completely shocked most of the time by what I realized I didn't know. It, it was really shocking. How did you educate yourself? Because obviously you, you realize that there's this huge opportunity, that there's not enough education. Definitely, I can <laughs> agree with that when it comes to sexual education. I'm 36. I feel like I know so little personally. Mm. 
where did you go for sources? It was it books and or some experts or like how did you educate yourself on this? Yeah, I, I don't know why it took me so long. Oh. Partially, I think I had to go through the path that most people will go through because there are resources out there like books which are informative that I, now I could say, okay, I have a list of books. Mm -hmm. If you want to educate yourself, mm -hmm. I've got these 10 pointers for you. Good resource, good article, good books, couple of podcasts, it'll reset your knowledge. Mm -hmm. But it took me forever to find it. I don't know how well hidden and things were, but literally until 2019, I had researched the industry for a number of years and I had no idea yet of what I know now. Mm -hmm. I had no idea of how big this is for us as humans, how important it is for us to reconnect with this. I had not fully appreciated how it can help with mental health issues, mm. how it can help shift attachment patterns through relationships, mm. all the constructs around shame, you know, that we suffer, all of us, mm. you know, that, that really restricts us mm. in our pleasure, mm -hmm. um, the value of pleasure as a medicine, how can we use pleasure as a way to heal ourselves, the fact that we can heal ourselves. You know, there's a lot of things we can do to to heal ourselves, that's not talk therapy, the importance of somatic in the therapeutic world. You know, if you think of all therapy, almost all therapy is talk therapy. As you say, the body keeps the score. Mm -hmm. So every time we have a trauma, uh, an emotional trauma, a physical trauma, the fascia, which is the connective tissue, that's mm -hmm. like a Spider-Man uh, web suit under your skin, gets contracted. It's con it, it, it basically just starts contracting. And if you do not attend to it, it will stay as an energy block and energy won't be able to fully flow through it, mm -hmm. right? So it's very important to have regular massage, body work. I discovered oh, another word, body work, my favorite activity of all what time. What is that? <laughs> I'm body learning work so much is today. about interacting it. with the body, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be massage. Mm -hmm. It can be touch. It can be sensual touch. It can mm -hmm. be soothing touch. It can be just applying hands. It can be energy work. It can be stretching. And this is one of the advice that I give mostly to couples who come to me and, you know, talk about sometimes mismatched arousal, one person wants sex, the other less, or they're not fully aligned or they've lost that spark, mm. is to give each other one directional, intentional touch with no expectation of mm. sex. And so my main activity uh, that I do uh, is body work. In the evening, if I'm with my partner, we do just do body work. We do hours of body work. I love that. <laughs> my love language is physical touch. So this and is so music to my ears. Imagine, you know, you touch, you, 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 you discover what you like. There's just so much stuff there, you know, to mm -hmm. discover about yourself, mm -hmm. for your partner to discover about you. And it's a very satisfying process. It's a very good mindful practice. Mm -hmm. You're present, you're in touch with yourself, you're resensitizing, you're connecting. It's an all-in-one practice mm -hmm. I recommend. You're telling me about like tips. Mm -hmm. I say like appreciating that you need to give your body time mm -hmm. and the importance of being able to receive for both men, women, and anyone who identifies in either of those groups or outside of those groups because if you have a body, you need to be able to receive and we very much in the action in our life. You know, it's easier for us to do than to be. So we intend to try to take people from sexual doing to sexual mm -hmm. being. Mm -hmm. You don't need to do so much. You know, the people who are very much in this sex, you know, space and they were natural in there, they tell you that s sex is like breathing. For many people, it's not the case. For me, it certainly wasn't the case. Sex was like, what am I doing? I'm stuck in my head. Shit, don't get stuck in your head. Go back into your body. Well, am I lasting too long? What am I doing? Is this pleasure? Oh, I've realized I'm not thinking. I'm thinking about something else for the past five minutes. Yeah. You know, or I'm bored or, oh, it's not what I want. Or should I say I want that? Oh no, it's got, it, literally, you, you're not in your body. Yeah. You, you're constantly kind of editing the experience, yeah. trying to find out what to do next. So there's a real retraining of presence because presence is the language of love it's what changes everything is the ability to be present so body work breathing um you know those kind of mindful practice that you do at all time where you just touch things and feel things they just split the time where you're here mm -hmm. versus when you're here so it gives you balance wow 
I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> blown away. I, I absolutely love what you said. Presence is the language of love. And I think, you know, it's such an easy gift we can first give to ourselves by being present. Like you said, practice just sitting with yourself, with your breath, moving through one body part to another just to feel the sensations that needs to be felt. But only when you can do that with yourself, then you can give that gift to your partner, totally. to your children, to your friends. It's so beautiful. Absolutely. In Paris, in the conference, it was a, a conference on consciousness. And I was really keen to open people's mind to the idea that even within the consciousness movement, mm -hmm. you know, if we are mostly spending time in our head as human beings, then all the solutions we will find will always be in our head. You cannot find another solution if you're not there. So what I wanted to bring to that was the opportunity to think about consciousness not as a status of the mind that has evolved through practice and meditation, but as a frequency mm -hmm. that I call love. Mm -hmm. If we can all really raise to operate from a place of love, not as love in the way that we understand it in our society, I give it to you, I take mm -hmm. it away when you're not nice to me, mm -hmm. but love as a frequency, I emit that frequency. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm doing. Then I think that's consciousness that's when we connect that's when we do see that there is intelligence that goes beyond me as an individual but there is this conscious intelligence that can help all of us move together and I feel that through the embodiment practice I had a much more direct entry into that experience I feel more connected I feel more in tune I can use more of my intelligence center if we were able to fully master ourselves we would be able to do so much more but because we focus all our intelligence, all our mm -hmm. energy is in the cerebral space, mm -hmm. we over-indexing in an area that is heavily manipulated versus true wisdom that is in the body by evolution. The body cannot lie. There's an imprint of your own evolution. So the, the knowledge is very pure. It's very direct. It's like remembering. It's not new knowledge. You know, because we've been here before. So it's not like we need something new. And I think that's why embodiments provide a balanced view on why we're here and how can we best use this amazing system to enjoy the world and have the human experience that is possible for us. Chloe, I think we need a part two. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> we could talk to you for Definitely, hours. Yeah. I think as we kind of wrap up, and I think we definitely need to have you on again and go deeper into maybe a certain subject and things like that. And this is why I'm so excited for you to be more public and speaking and getting out there because you truly have, you know, over your own journey, so much, you know, incredible, you know, I don't know, wisdom is the right word. Just, insights. Just insights, well, yeah. ins insights really to share that. The reason we're resonating, whether it be you're listening or you're watching, I think as I'm resonating now, you know, we've done over 100 podcasts in our previous podcast, and I've, I consume a lot of content. Uh, but intuitively for me, I'm always like, I don't, I, I try not to judge based, oh, this person has written all these books, so they did that. I try to go more with my body intuition. I'm like, does this make sense to me? Mm -hmm. Is this something that I resonate with? And it doesn't matter who it's coming from, whether it's, you know, Bill Gates or whatever. It's more about, as this person, what's the information and content there? Mm -hmm. And everything that you've said so far, it just it resonates so much every time we've kind of met. And I'll, I guess as we close, one of the things I, I, I do want to give the opportunity for you to speak is really about Kama. Because mm -hmm. I understand it's a journey and you have this mission. What is that next thing that you're developing that you want also people listening right now are watching to maybe learn more about common what you're doing and how it can also help them to do a lot of the things that you're speaking about now because i think for a lot of people listening or watching they're like okay this all sounds great i'm resonating but like what are the next steps yeah. and is common kind of part of that solution as well to help people with a lot of mm -hmm. that embodiment work mm -hmm. i really wanted to um make things practical you know, I really believe that if you give people tools, uh, anyone can adopt them that are really thought through. And when I started in this field, everyone said, oh, it's great. You're going to create a brand for women, women like you. And, it, you know, it's going to be very easy because you can resonate with those people. And I was very adamant to create a 
brand and a product that was actually to educate everyone. Mm -hmm. And this is very a strong part of my fight, you know, my, my mission, personal mission for me. I believe that when we can give something to the masses and if it gets adopted, then the entire culture can change. So I'm much more interested in building something that can be adopted easily by people, which is why Kama is a form of discovery and learning application where we have just courses. So if you want to learn about cooking, you know, you just take a course on, you know, how to do a puff pastry and how to do different types of things. With sex, we have course about how to breathe during sex, use your pelvic floor, how to connect with yourself, um, manage shame, learn how to give a blowjob, how you use your hands, how you use your body, how you resensitize. Mm -hmm. You know, it's basically practical techniques, skill learning, tutorials, where you go through the process of relearning. And we try to present it from the place, imagine you don't know anything about sex. It's easier if you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And then we take people back. And the reason that we, we, we go direct into the topic, let's say, of how to give a blowjob or you know, how to build more intimacy during sex is because it's by telling them how to do that differently that we can transform the entire experience for them. So when we talk about intimacy, we explain that intimacy is the space between you and your partner. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing that you share is that space. You know, there is an idea that relationship is something we create and, and, and it's half you and half me, but actually it really is just that space. So intimacy is about nurturing the space. So practically what that means, well, is the space clean? of your emotion, of your anger, of your resentment. You need to clean the space first. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a one-on-one -on -one with your partner regularly and say, what's up? Did I say anything that upset you? Is there something you're holding back? Are you stressed mm -hmm. about something? Just let it out, do the exercise. You know, it's called like, I would say emotional hygiene. Mm -hmm. You know, the second step is do your own practice. You know, take 10 minutes a day to breathe on your own, connect to your body. Sometimes I say, if you don't spend two hours with your body every day, what are you doing here? You know, we got to rethink mm -hmm. how we split our time and allocate that time to do something that's related to sensation, feeling, mm -hmm. connection. So that's the second practice. Find a way to connect to yourself uh, that is independent completely from your partner. Go away on your own sometimes. Do something on your own with no distraction mm. to try and find that connection. And then the third thing is make it an experiment. You know, if you're in an experiment, there's no right and wrong. So set it up to say, okay, uh, what do you want to learn about your sex life? Well, I would love to learn how to squirt. I've never been able to do that. I would love to learn. Okay, well, I'm going to help you with that. Let's take the camera app. Let's look at the squirting course. Let's learn together. Let's practice. Let's have fun. And maybe it will be a mess. Maybe I won't manage. Maybe we learn something. So it's really thinking of your relationship mm -hmm. as a container for experimentation whether it's emotional experimentation or pleasure experimentation or, or new types of touch or you want to go beyond a boundary, you know, you have mm. something that's really blocking you mm. and you can use sexuality as a way to move energy, mm. to, to shift your mindset, to uh, electrify your body, to just get yourself into a better mindset. So it's really thinking of it as a tool to grow, to connect, to get a, a more enjoyable life, much more than something you need to perform to be successful at, where there's expectations, uh, which is mostly where people are at, so a lot of honesty. You know, we try to really facilitate for people to talk about sex in a way that's not awkward, so that more honesty can come. Because there won't be any honesty if everyone is embarrassed to share their anxiety, performance issue, their mm -hmm. fears. So first, we need to make the conversation easy. So mm -hmm. this is what I try to do with you guys. When I talk, I just want to show, you can talk about sex. Normalize and talk it. about blowjob and squirting yeah. and anus, anything. It's your body. Yeah. There is really nothing there to be ashamed of. What could be more natural? How can people go beyond that shame and... Um, resistance to this information because I know many people want to learn but even in myself I can sometimes sense that resentment like it's okay I don't need that yes so this is you 
But it's the fear. This is I your can system recognize telling you, say, oh, please don't change anything. Let's stay lazy. It's much safer that way, right? So you're always going to have resistance for anything new. You know, at the moment, uh, to give you an example, so I go through everything that's on the app, which is why my journey is long. Mm -hmm. You know, my rediscovering of my own sexuality is taking time because I'm literally, not that I choose to, I'm... Every block that I meet is a block that a lot of people are confronted with. And at the moment, I'm working on slut shaming and this idea that as women, but okay. also maybe uh, for men too, but as women specifically, we are very con conditioned mm -hmm. by the idea of certain behavior make you a slut. And it's very quick to be judged that way. So you have a lot of memories as a kid, mm -hmm. growing up as a girl, as a young adult, where you showed up in a particular way with no intention to create provocation and you were told that's inappropriate, you look like a slut. So you now have to deprogram this. So I'm going through this amazing process at the moment with this group of women and we are going into our slut persona and we are behaving like slut and we are acting that way and doing the things that we would never do before mm -hmm. which we would be judged for as a way to rewrite mm -hmm. in order to change the experience you have to create a new experience mm -hmm. you know that's how the body keeps the score mm -hmm. tell the body listen now i've got something new trust me we're going to do this and then you just do it and then the body will come along mm -hmm. you know i literally have goosebumps <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much, Chloe. It's, uh, I guess the last question is really where can people find you, um, comma app, also yourself, because uh, I'm sure so many people will be want to go deeper into this experience of getting to learn more about you. The same way when I met you in Paris, I'm like, I got to go <laughs> talk to Chloe, find out where, where she's at. So Thank you. So first, the Kama is on the App Store and Google Play at Kama, K-A-M-A, -A, K -A so that's just straightforward. Uh, Kama.lab is the Instagram. But what I'm really excited about this year is that we're launching a bunch of retreats and workshops and sex camps, which is going to be really fun. So the retreats are more for couples. Um, they are for people who are really wanting to go deeper. Uh, we're going to create an amazing experience. We're going to do workshops, which are short, maybe two day in cities. They're more mm -hmm. to kind of get people to get enough to be curious. Mm -hmm. And then sex camps, these happen in a, like retreats, groups of young people. Uh, we're going to teach them how to create a play party, how to have group sex, how to do embodiment, how to do body work, anything that they just open it to a playground. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. You are invited to all of it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Wow. <laughs> it's all very exciting. Uh, thank you again, Chloe, you for being here, for your presence, for sharing your wisdom and insights, and for so eloquently telling us, you know, how we can all grow and be more and experience more. Thank you. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Boris. And create intelligence in our lives and our bodies. So thank you so much, Chloe. Thank you, Chloe. <laughs>